Good day, and welcome to today's webcast, Spontaneous Awakening and Spontaneous Breathing Trials, Strategy to Optimize Patient Outcomes. Assistance with slide advancements, please. To participate in today's webcast by submitting a question, please use the question box that appears on your screen. Once you've typed in your question, click on the Send button. For technical problems, please call 1-800-263-6317 and press 1 for GoToWebinar. Future access uh, for this presentation will be available within five business days at www.iculiberation.org. Next. This webcast is being sponsored by the Society of Critical Care Medicine Council in support of improved outcomes for ICU patients and their families. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce our faculty for today. Joining us this, this afternoon are Dr. Michael Cauley, who is a pharmacist, respiratory therapist, and a fellow of the American College of Critical Care Medicine. Dr. Cauley is a professor of clinical pharmacy and he is the Vice Chair of the Department of Pharmacy Practice and Administration at the Philadelphia College of Pharmacy, University of the Sciences in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And also our colleague Ken Hargett, who is a respiratory therapist and Director of Respiratory Care at the Houston Methodist Hospital in Houston, Texas. He is an Assistant Professor at the University of Texas in Galveston, Texas. Welcome you both, and I'll hand the broadcast over to Dr. Colley. Thank you, Lori. Ladies and gentlemen, a couple of learning objectives we'd like to accomplish today are the following. The first is we'd like to explore the role of spontaneous awakening trials, SATs, and spontaneous breathing trials, SBTs, as a quality strategy in reducing ICU length of stay and ventilator length of stay. From now on, the rest of the program, I will be talking about spontaneous awakening trials as SATs and spontaneous breathing trials as SBTs. A second objective is to discover how team communication can be improved to facilitate implementation of standardized care plans. And finally, we'd like to discuss the role of pharmacological weaning in achieving care plan goals to more successfully wean patients from mechanical ventilation. Today's overview will follow the following uh, format. First of all, we'd like to cover deep sedation outcomes. From there, we'd like to go into perceived barriers of daily sedation interruption. Then we would like to go into a clinical case and some audience polling questions. And we'd like to infuse that clinical case because it's patients we deal with on a daily basis and will give us an interaction to see what institutions may do things differently. Then I'd like to discuss SAT and SBT definitions, followed by outcome data of both SAT and SBT, pharmacological selection for these patients, and finally, pharmacological weaning and a conclusion. So first, I'd like to start off their strategies to optimize patient care. And first of all, the first slide I'd like to talk about here and to discuss is this is a practice of utilizing daily interruption of sedatives is fairly low when you look at the data. As you can see here, less than half of practitioners worldwide have implemented daily interruption of sedatives. And as you can see, it's a small sample size. But if you're looking at countries such as Germany, Canada, and the United States, you could see that we're about 34% to 40% uh, in regards to practicing daily interruption of sedatives. Now, what I'd like to talk about is a really great study. This is by Shahabi et al. And this is in the American Journal of Respiratory Critical Care Medicine 2012. This was actually a study where it was a multi-center cohort study in uh, 251 patients where they looked at 25 Australian and New Zealand hospitals. And these were patients in medical surgical ICU that were ventilated and were sedated for at least 24 hours or more. Now what I'd like to show you is we're looking at both the XY axis, the X, you see the days from zero out to 180 days, and the Y axis we're looking at mortality risk. If you look at the data, we have the dark blue line, which is the deep, uh, deeply sedated patients, and the broken purple line, which is deeply, uh, deeply sedated, which is, the, which is the purple line, and not deeply sedated, which is the blue line. And this data was telling us that patients who were deeply sedated early, within the first 48 hours, as you can see in the first uh, early part of that graph, 
showed significant reduction, reduced survival, and they had a long rank of about 0 0.04, was statistically significant compared to patients not deeply sedated. And you can see the deep sedation, 10% increase in hospital death, and 8% increased risk of death at 180 days. Now, this included over 2,600 study days and over 14,000 RAS assessments. Now, just looking at that and understanding how important deep sedation and how that could potentially affect our outcomes, what I'd like to do is just switch the uh, presentation over to Ken, and he's going to discuss a little bit about perceived barriers of sedation protocols and daily sedation interruption. Ken? Thanks, Michael. Um, so the, the culture shock that occurs when we start talking about uh, taking patients out of deep sedation and lightening the sedation and the information we're learning from the literature uh, is, is pretty significant. Uh, and uh, in institutions that have tried to um, implement the sedation, pain, agitation, delirium guidelines uh, look at these barriers uh, and uh, find ways to overcome those. But uh, if we look at uh, this multidisciplinary study, um, some of the barriers, uh, no specific physician order for a sedation awakening trial or spontaneous breathing trial, uh, lack of nursing support, talk a little bit more about that in a second, uh, and then fear of over sedation, uh, you know, pretty much in this 2009 study. Uh, and then barriers for the sedation interruption the particular piece that we have the opportunity to lighten sedation. Here again, nursing acceptance, uh, fear that patients will self-extubate or pull lines out, um, respiratory compromise, and then patient discomfort. So when we look at why do we sedate patients so heavily on, on uh, particularly on mechanical ventilation, uh, that's sort of the root of the, the piece. Um, and um, this study from Osterman looked at um, uh, the target level of sedation and whether or not we were titrating patients to a lighter level of sedation or to a, a specific RAS or some indicator of their sedation um, and that um, most of the sedation is sort of um, PRN ad lib based on the nursing preference um, and in most cases nurses really believe that it's easier to take care of patients on uh, particularly mechanical ventilation if they're heavily sedated uh, and there are several studies in the nursing literature uh, that from the empathy standpoint and the, the nursing feelings for the patient they feel patients are uncomfortable so they want to keep them heavily sedated uh, and not move them to a lighter level of sedation. Uh, if we look at patients fighting the ventilator uh, which is a reason that people cite for, for uh, more heavily sedating the patients, then it's really what mode of ventilation are they in uh, and we're finding in the literature that uh, assist control is often very uncomfortable to the patient because we can't match their flow rates and volumes. So that mode of ventilation uh, is, is a, a contributing factor to heavier sedation. Even SIMV, which confuses the respiratory centers when it goes between machine breaths and spontaneous breaths. Uh, sometimes get the patient out of sync with the ventilator requiring more sedation. Um, and we're seeing that deep sedation, not only is it uh, uh, changing the outcomes and higher mortality, but that um, it's causing the patients to uh, weaken their diaphragms, which causes them to be on the ventilator longer, uh, and this ventilator-induced ventilator -induced diaphragmatic dysfunction uh, is emerging as a piece that's uh, associated with deep sedation. So I'll give it back to you now, Michael. Um. Okay, Ken, thank you. I think we're going to be talking about our clinical case. So ladies and gentlemen, let's take a look at this patient. This is a typical patient you may have in your ICU. A GR is a 57-year-old, 60-kilogram male with history of chronic renal insufficiency is recovering in the ICU from MRSA bacteremia slash sepsis. Neurologically, the patient has a Glasgow Coma score of 6, where the patient only opens his eyes and squeezes his hands based upon um, a request. Sedation analgesia is on a lorazepam or Ativan drip at 8 milligrams per hour and morphine sulfate at 6 milligrams per hour. His RAS score, he's got moderate sedation of negative 3, and his pain score is about 5, which is moderate. Cardiac, he's got MAP of 68, and on mechanical ventilation, he's on an AC of 14, assist control, 14 breaths per minute, tidal volume of 700, 40%, and 2.5 of PEEP, 
the saturation is about 92%. His lab data has got a serum creatinine elevation of about 2.7, potentially has an acute kidney injury occurring here. His I's and O's over 24 hours, he's got 3,100 in and 800 out. His cultures, blood, sputum, et cetera, are negative, and he's got a low-grade temperature of 99.1. So looking at that, I, I'd like you to ponder this, either as a group or you know, as looking at it yourself, is would JR qualify for SAT or an SBT within your institution? I think based upon this, this is a typical patient that we may see. There may be some data in this that you may say, well, no, he may not qualify, and some individuals may think he would qualify. So I think it's a very good situation to think about for our patients in the ICU if this person would qualify for it or not. Now, going from there, I think we need to talk about the simplistic uh, issues of an SAT exclusion criteria. They, these are pretty common sense, but it's important for us to understand that these are probably situations where we don't uh, want to start a person on an SAT. And we're talking about if we're looking to withdraw life support, if they have active hemoptysis, of course, they have active myocardial ischemia, they have an elevated ICP greater than 20 millimeters, he's got some type of seizure activity, ongoing seizure activity or potential alcohol seizure activity or alcohol withdrawal, or the patient is on neuromuscular blockade. So in understanding that, let's talk a little bit about what SATs are. And I think, again, this is very uh, probably review for some of us, but it's important for us to understand. And this is from Dr. Kress from New England Journal of Medicine uh, from his data. And the SAT is composed of simply two parts. One is the safety screen, and the other is the trial. Now, when we talk about a safety screen for a patient, there's two parts of that. And the first part is, if the patient is able to complete three of four simple tasks at request. And based upon Dr. Kress's paper, we talk about three of the four, which could be patient opening the eyes, they're looking at the caregiver on command, squeezing their hand based upon command, or asking them to stick out their tongue or put out their tongue uh, when they can. Now from there, we have to talk now about safety screen part two. So we're looking more of the, the other issues in regards to the patient. Are they having adequate oxygenation, adequate SAO2 on a low FiO2 and low PEEP? And then you can see those parameters there. And of course, from a, a spontaneous inspiratory effort perspective, are they able to maintain that? Also talking about no ag agitation, and potentially no evidence of myocardial ischemia in the previous 24 hours. And also vasopressors. We don't want patients to be on vasopressors or any type of hemodynamic support and I have some of the agents and doses listed there. And of course, if there's uh, no evidence of intracranial pressure. From there, I'd like to briefly talk about SBTs. And I think Ken is gonna go into this in a little more detail, but SBT is composed also of two parts. When we talk about a safety screen, it's very, very similar to what we talked about before for the SATs. Patients could be on vasopressors, higher FiO2s, higher PEEPs. And again, there's a lot of in interesting information in the literature and there's papers that are, uh, a number of papers that are published that have different metrics that they specifically look at. From there, we talk about ventilatory support removal. What type of um, a mode are you going to use for the patient and take them off the ventilator and put them on a T-tube or a bypass, or are you gonna put them on CPAP, potentially five centimeters of CPAP using pressure support or a combination of CPAP or pressure support with no change in FiO2. But it's also interesting to note that how do they fail? We're looking at some type of criteria for failure. And again, very important that if you're creating this within your institution, to looking at best practice to determine what would be the best parameters that you, pulmonologist, and the critical care team to a, can agree to or the intensivist. As you can see, some of them a high respiratory rate or a low respiratory rate, SAO2 of less than 88%. Of course, some uh, other issues of abrupt change in mental status and some type of arrhythmia that can develop. And of course, if there's some type of respiratory distress, patient's diaphoretic, uh, desaturation, or whatever it may be. So ladies and gentlemen, what I would like to do right now is turn the um, uh, presentation over to Ken, and he's going to elaborate more on the SBT protocols. Ken? Thanks. The, the first thing to, to look, oh, so uh, I guess we go to this audience polling. Um, so what action should be taken if a patient becomes agitated during an SAT or an SBT? And so the possible answers are uh, heavily resedate the patient, resedate to a RAS of minus three, titrate to a RAS of minus one and return to the previous vent settings, or continue the SAT-SBT. Give you a few moments to, uh, to vote. <laughs> 
So it looks like we're coming in at uh, the titrate the RAS back to a minus one and return to the previous vent settings, which would be the most correct answer. Um, agitated, there are a couple of ways to approach that. Uh, one is to uh, work with the patient and try to calm them down because sometimes it takes a little longer than during that safety screen to uh, uh, get them to calm down. So depending on the patient situation, but uh, you know, the, my experience is, you know, this patient's failing, let's resedate him, and that's not the correct answer. Uh, and so the intent is to try to get them back to as light a sedation as possible. So titration of the sedation back to a RAS of minus one, and then if the patient continues to be agitated, return to the previous vent settings. That that doesn't mean wait till tomorrow to do this again. I mean, it can be done again in, in uh, uh, an, an appropriate period of time, but uh, uh, it may just be that at that point in time. Uh, so, um, the, the spontaneous breathing protocols have been developed over a period of time uh, and really came work done in the 90s and part of the consensus statement from 2001 that the gradual reduction of mechanical ventilation, the turning down of the IMV rate or the turning down of the pressure support is, is really not the best way to, to to try to get patients off the ventilator. The best way is to assess their ability to be off the ventilator uh, on a daily basis, which is what drives the spontaneous breathing protocol. Uh, and the intent is to put them on minimal support uh, and see if they can breathe on their own. Um, so uh, as this protocol looks at, um, you have to set some criteria in regards to minimum eligibility for the spontaneous breathing trial. Um, similar to the spontaneous awakening trial for the, the uh, sedation, but we need to, the patient to be on, you know, uh, some level of oxygen, 50, 60 percent uh, is usually the, the range. Uh, they can be on some level of PEEP since we're going to turn that down. Um, and they can't be, have high, super high minute ventilations. So the those first screen criteria would determine the eligibility of a patient on a spontaneous breathing trial. Uh, and then we've got to make sure that their uh, pain's being managed uh, and that um, uh, the pairing of this that uh, we'll talk about uh, sedation awakening trial and spontaneous breathing trial is part of the logit logistics. Uh, but in order to conduct this on a patient, we're essentially turning off the parameters from the ventilator. So we're turning off the rate we can put it on some level of CPAP or, or PEEP, um, and then uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of the derivations of how to use pressure support, um, and then see how the patient responds. And here again, you may have to walk the patient through it and calm them down because they've been accustomed to, to the ventilator doing a lot of the work for them. Um, and the minimum period of time that they should be on these very minimal settings is 30 minutes to determine if they're okay on their own and up to 120 minutes. Um, and that will tell us whether or not they can, can do well without the ventilatory support. Um, during that period of time, we need to be able to look at uh, whether or not they, they, they fail. Um, so if we look at, the, this is actually our uh, algorithm here at my institution, um, we look at whether or not they, uh, uh, their RSBI, the Rapid Shallow Breathing Index, or their frequency tidal volume, exceeds 105 minutes for a period of greater than five minutes. Uh, so if, if they spike their respiratory rate for just a little bit and we can calm them back down, they're okay, uh, but uh, it requires being able to walk them through it. And so that RSBI coming from information uh, from um, Yang and Tobin uh, looked at uh, what the fatigue rate is. Uh, and then they need to be able to maintain their saturations uh, during the trial, not have any arrhythmias, and uh, keep a fairly stable heart rate, uh, and setting a maximum on our protocol of 140 beats per minute or 20% increase from baseline. Um, and then uh, if they pass that, we need to look at whether or not they can be extubated, and we need to look at other parameters such as uh, airway leak, and we can talk about that in a second. but. Uh, um, um, can they manage their secretions? Um, and um, 
sometimes there's other parameters like can they hold their head up and, and other pieces. Uh, then the decision needs to be made in order to, to extubate them or, or liberate them from the ventilator. So uh, I said the modifications, uh, the original spontaneous breathing trials were performed on a key completely off the ventilator. Uh, so there was no CPAP, no pressure support, uh, and uh, that, that data, you know, uh, required very close monitoring and a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of time and effort. Um, a lot of places do these now on the ventilator because it has the safety backup uh, from a rate on the, on the ventilator if the patient goes apneic. It also gives us the monitoring capabilities where we can calculate this RSBI. Uh, we can look at trend graphs. Uh, and so a lot of people do this on the ventilator and there's different derivations of it. Um, trying to mimic the T-tube of zero um, is one of the settings, but more recently because of ventilator-associated events and ventilator-associated pneumonia, uh, some level of PEEP to prevent secretions from entering the lungs uh, is probably appropriate. Um, the use of tubing compensation, which is a mechanism on the ventilator that uh, overcomes the resistance of the endotracheal tube. Um, tubing compensation is a form of pressure support that um, uh, changes from breath to breath, but in a very vigorously breathing patient, there can be 12 or 15 centimeters of pressure support based on tubing compensation. So uh, there's questions whether or not tubing compensation should be in integrated into the spontaneous breathing trial or not. So these are all different different uh, approaches to this. And then the results of the spontaneous breathing trial needs to be communicated with the physician uh, and this is our original paper progress note that we looked at whether or not the spontaneous breathing trial uh, was not performed and for what reason and then how long it actually occurred if we conducted it um, and if they failed, why they failed. Uh, and then we have some of our uh, parameters that physicians request before considering uh, extubation. And um, then we track how often we get an order for extubation and in what period of time. Um, so I said failure criteria, if the patient spikes a respiratory rate for a long period of time and starts to fatigue, uh, if the heart rate's elevated or the RSBI is the key failure factor. So another audience polling, how long after successful uh, spontaneous awakening trial paired with an SBT should you wait to extubate the patient? So we've come in, you know, with the answer immediately, and that would be my correct answer. Um, it's sometimes problematic, depending on uh, logistics in a different unit. And we've gone through uh, sort of several years of derivations of this, looking at how quickly we can get it done, whether or not we need a physician order, whether or not we're waiting on rounds. Uh, but um, if you wait after you do the spontaneous breathing trial, uh, for a period of time, you are more likely to have the patient extubate themselves um, and um, then you have to track whether or not um, they're getting re-intubated. So there are a lot of logistics, uh, but immediately after the patient uh, declares themselves as being eligible to be off the ventilator, that should be the time to get, get them extubated. So if you're looking at, at uh, quality measures uh, for um, uh, spontaneous awakening trials, uh, and spontaneous breathing trials. Uh, some of the measures would be percent of orders for a spontaneous awakening trial. How many of your eligible patients uh, actually get an order? Uh, percent of eligible patients that have an order that it's actually performed on, and what is the accuracy of the charting, and if the orders are to titrate to a, a specific RAS, then um, uh, what is the reliability of that, how often is it charted, uh, and uh, inter-regular reliability of measuring RAS. And then self-extubation rate. Uh, I said that was one of the concerns in regards to, to patients 
being on lighter sedation is that they may pull their, their tube out. Um, but if they pull the tube out and it doesn't get put back in, uh, then they probably didn't need it in the first place. Uh, and then another measure for, for quality measure for spontaneous awaiting trials is um, uh, how much benzodiazepines are being used uh, and what types of drugs are you using. So uh, spontaneous breathing trials are again similar number of eligible patients that actually have a spontaneous breathing trial performed, percent that pass the spontaneous breathing trial, reasons for the spontaneous breathing trial failure, um, percent successful SBT that end up getting a, uh, an order to liberate them from the ventilator, uh, and then I said reintubation rates. Um, reintubation rates in the literature from spontaneous breathing trials should be in the 12 to 15 percent range. Uh, and so if you're below 12 to 15 percent, uh, you're having a very conservative approach. Um, and then that self-extubation and whether or not they get reintubated. So tracking this from a quality improvement standpoint, performance improvement, this is just an old graph from our institution that looked at uh, setting a, um, a, a threshold to see whether or not we were using spontaneous breathing trials. Um, and uh, actually getting an order for extubation. And we have five different ICUs that vary different through the different ICUs, a little different patient populations there, but uh, uh, we really, really pushed this up. And I said this is older graph, and now we're, all the units are above 80% of the time. When a patient passes a spontaneous breathing trial, do, we get an order to liberate them from the ventilator. So I'll give it back to you now, Mike. Okay, thanks, Ken. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, some SCT and SBD outcomes that have been well versed in the literature, and I have four of them listed here, and there are many more than this, but the studies that I have listed here are probably one of the, the major ones that have been identified consistently in the literature. Is we know that the decreased days of mechanical ventilation, uh, without a doubt, that uh, using this type of um, uh, monitoring for SATs and SBTs definitely does that. Also, decreasing weaning time. So when you have teams that work effectively, uh, the weaning time can be reduced. Besides that, as Ken just mentioned before about trying to, you know, having reduced reintubation rates. Uh, we're trying to prevent that as much as possible, and uh, SCTs and SBTs have, have definitely have shown that throughout the literature. We also talk about delirium. There's been a, you know, talking about delirium um, for the past few years has been a very hot topic. Uh, there's been a number of studies that come out on that, but again, fewer days with delirium, which is again another positive outcome with this type of um, setup. And then, of course, some of the other major metrics, a decreased length of ICU stay, decreased length of hospital stay. Um, and um, that's kind of it when we're talking about this outcome. So they're very, very beneficial. What I'd like to do now is uh, just switch gears a little bit. As I talked about in the previous, in the earlier part of the program, I talked about deep sedation in critically ill patients and how detrimental that is to patients. But I also now like to flip the coin and talk about survival benefit of linked sedation interruption with SBTs. And this was Dr. Gerard and Lance at 2008. This was a really great study. It actually involved four tertiary care hospitals of about 336 ventilator patients. And they were randomly assigned to two different groups. Uh, they, one group got daily SATs followed by an SBT. And that was the interventional group. There was about 168 patients, as you can see there in the purple. And then we have uh, the other group with sedation per usual care plus a daily SBT. And they were the control group of patients. And as you can see, you have the X uh, ratio, or the X uh, axis, which is 0 to 360 days. And you have the Y axis when we're looking at patients alive. The bottom of that, we have patients at risk uh, for an SAT plus an SBT versus usual care plus an SBT. And you can see the numbers go down as the days of randomization occur. But what you noticed here is with this information is that um, patients managed with an SAT plus an SBT were about 32% uh, less likely to die than patients in the control group. And their improved survival at one year was a, a hazard ratio of 0.68 and was statistically significant of 0.01. They also shown that for every seven patients who were treated with an SAT plus an SBT, one life was saved. So it was a very strong, powerful study that shown us the benefits of SAT and SBT. So let's go back to our clinical case. Remember JR? You know, we were talking about this gentleman, the 57-year-old with the chronic renal insufficiency, and he's recovering in the ICU from MRSA, bactremia, and sepsis. Again, looking at the parameters that we said before, 
His GCS is six. He opens his eyes. It squeezes his hand. His RAS is minus three on Ativan and a, our lorazepam morphine drip and a pain score of five. His MAP is 68. Uh, he's on the ventilator as assist control, as we can see there, with 92% saturation. And his labs, of course, were the same, serum creatinine of 2.7. His eyes and O's are there. His blood cultures are negative, and he's got a temp of 99.1. So what I'd like to do is ask everyone the following question. Which of the following would potentially disqualify JR for SAT? Would Louise Payman work thing? His GCS of 6, where he opens his eyes and squeezes his hand, an FIO to a 40%, PEEP of 2.5, and a saturation of 92%, or a pain score of 5? Oh, we're split here. Oh, this is very interesting. So lorazepam and morphine dosing of 42%, pain score of 5 of 42%, only 5% picked the ventilator, and 11% picked the GCS score. Wow, this is really interesting. So let's look at this in a little bit more detail. So when we talk about the patient specifically, the optimum answer for the patient is the GCS of 6. The patient only opens their eyes and squeezes his hand. Lorazepam morphine dosing really wouldn't affect the patient because it's based upon you know, sedation scores and so forth. So we can monitor that based upon that. The FiO2 of 40%, PEEP and SAO2 are very, very low. We'll talk about that. And pain score really has really no effect in disqualifying him from an SAT based upon the literature that's out there. So let's take a look. As we said about before, we were talking about from Dr. Kress. Now remember, this is an important point. What I'm basing this on is based upon Dr. Kress's data. And again, it's a little bit different. Some people may subjectively uh, have things a little bit differently throughout the literature. But at least based upon this, the GCS and the neurological status is paramount in regards to determining if they would disqualify the patient. And as you can see here, he, the patient, JR, actually was able to open eyes and squeeze the patient's hand. He was only able to complete two of the four. So again, that's very subjective. I would like to be at the bedside to say, listen, can he actually look at me if I ask him to stick out his tongue? Can he do that? So again, those are very, very important points. Now, safety screen part two, if you look at a lot of the parameters, as I said before, one of the top ones we have is about oxygenation. Our patient, JR, he was on an FiO2 of 40%. His PEEP was 2.5, and his saturation was 92%. So if his oxygenation parameters and metrics were much worse at this level, that would mean that that would be a problem. But as you could see, he was better than that, and he didn't quite meet that metric. And there was no others that he was on, of course, at this point in time. So let's go back to him again, and we're going to talk about again and ask you another question. So I'm not going to repeat everything. Everything is the same with JR, exactly the same thing. His neurological his sedation status is uh, MAP, is the ventilator, and all his lab data. So I'm going to ask you the following question, another question, and see what you think from this perspective. Which of the following agent or agents for JR would be the most optimum for sedation or analgesia? Is it one, maintain lorazepam and morphine? Two, change morphine to dexmedetomidine? C, or the next one, change lorazepam to midazolam? Or the last one is change both lorazepam and morphine to propofol Oh, very good. Most, most of 74% changed both lorazepam and morphine to propofol and fentanyl. 17% changed the morphine, and 6% and 4% picked the other two. You're absolutely correct. Changing both the lorazepam and morphine to propofol and fentanyl would be the most optimum choice. Now, what I'd like to do is talk about the clinical pharmacology a little bit more so you, we understand uh, globally when we're looking at our patients. We're talking about clinical pharmacology of sedatives and opioid analgesics, and this is from Dr. Barr in Critical Care Medicine. And on the left, I have the agent from midazolam all the way down to hydromorphone. I have the onset of effect after a loading dose in minutes, the elimination half-life in hours, an active metabolite if the drug does have one or not, and adverse effects. And as you can see, I have some of the things in red and a couple things I want to bring up. When we were specifically talking about JR, talking about lorazepam and morphine, Remember, his serum creatinine was 2.7, so his creatinine clearance was, was pretty poor based upon that. Uh, his elimination half-life is going to be increased. This is 8 to 15 hours with normal renal function. So if you have increased in renal failure, an increase in serum creatinine, 
or um, poor renal function, your half-life is going to go up significantly. Although it doesn't have active metabolites, it's something we have to be concerned of. And also, I mean, some people may think of lorazepam as a large amount of propylene glycol. And based upon how much the patient is exposed to, you could cause the patient to have a lactic acidosis and so forth. Propofol, on the other hand, as you can see, it doesn't have any active met metabolites. And the half-life in the literature is between 3 to 12 hours. But again, propofol, if you're looking at an alpha and beta half-life, which are different. A lot of patients, of course, when you shut off propofol, maybe within 15 minutes or less, some patients will wake right up. But there's also the beta effect, where the, the drug stays on for a prolonged period of time. But of course, the adverse effects are hypotension and pancreatitis. Morphine and fentanyl, let's we'll spend a little time on that. And I've seen this so many times, where you have morphine, which is, you're talking about this drug that has multiple active metabolites, morphine six, 3 and 6 glucuronide. And these both accumulate in both renal and hepatic impairment, especially during a continuous infusion. So this, these patients, specifically elderly, who are receiving these drugs with poor renal function, can hold on to morphine for significant periods of time. On the other hand, we have fentanyl. You know, fentanyl is a, doesn't have any active metabolites. It has a very short half-life and has less hypotension than morphine, less histamine release. So fentanyl and uh, propofol would probably be the most optimum agents to choose for our patient at this time. Now, talking about that, we'd like to talk a little bit about pharmacological selection. And this is a very hot topic, but we have very limited time to talk about this today. If we look at the information with Dr. Bari, he talks about that all IV opioids are associated with similar outcomes when titrated to similar pain intensity endpoints, and that is true. And there were some recommendations in regards to, you know, from looking at the um, sedation and analgesic guidelines of talking about agitation and sedation of what drugs may be preferred. Propofol over lorazepam, maybe because of its short half-life and, uh, you know, less ability to hang on with active metabolites. Dexmedetomidine for its sedative and also potentially anal some analgesic effects over midazolam. Benzodiazepines, of course, are needed for all patients that are agitated. It's just a matter of how you're going to dose them and what drug you're going to use. And then morphine accumulation and renal failure. But we all know, and some of the challenges that we've had, is drug shortages. We know we, some of us have struggled with propofol. Some of us have struggled trying to get midazolam. So we have to modify our dosing. Although we have guidelines and protocols to optimize, sometimes you know, the, the market will throw us a curveball that we have to uh, alternate our plans in regards to dosing our patients. Now, from a pharmacological weaning plan, this is something which is kind of interesting. You know, if you look throughout the literature, uh, if you talk about weaning of any sort, every time you hear about the word weaning, it's also always about the ventilator. Because there's very limited data published on pharmacological weaning. Weaning is focused primarily on ventilator mechanics and sedation scoring. You know, doing a literature search myself and looking throughout the literature, that's primarily what is focused on. But I think it's important that we have to actually look at pharmacological weaning. I think that's a very important point. And it's interesting that in the old critical care medicine guidelines in 2002, and Dr. Jacoby and all put that together, there was actually talking about a taper infusion. And it talked about benzodiazepines or opioids that if you're going to taper the infusion, you should taper it by about 10 to 25 percent per day. Now, again, this isn't uh, a panacea. It's not for all patients. But it's a general rule of thumb that we would use for our patients when we're considering our weaning and considering SATs and SBTs, that we should consider tapering both of our infusions as they're tolerated based upon pain scores, sedation and RAS scores, and so forth. But one thing I want to mention is about polypharmacy. I've seen this so many times in my career that it's it's very disheartening many a times. I've seen a lot of times where a medical team will talk about uh, ventilator weaning the patient and weaning the patient and starting the weaning tomorrow or the next day. And what would happen is, unfortunately, there would be a whole host and whole slew of PRN medications. You name it, we have the fentanyls, the morphines, the halbals, the Seroquel. I think everybody kind of go understands where I'm going with this. You get a whole host and potpourri of these different uh, medications, and unfortunately the nurse may not have the most optimum a plan or directions in regards to giving them, or may have trouble assessing the patient, and may give a cocktail of various drugs through the night. And what happens is when you come in at 7 in the morning or 8 in the morning and you're going to wean the patient, the patient's totally unresponsive and un, you can't, you know, they're over-sedated. So I get very, very concerned about uh, over-sedating and polypharmacy, especially PRN medications. So I think it's very, very important as a plan, as a medical team, to talk about specifically drug therapy in regards to their patient and address that issue as that weaning process is going to begin and to make sure everybody on the team is aware and understands the plan 
uh, so it's implemented uh, flawlessly. But one point I want to bring up is Dr. Gerard from 2008, the study I talked about before. He was talking about when patients fail on SAT, what do you do with sedatives? And their general rule there was that to restart the sedatives at half the previous dose and then titrate the comfort. I, again, I don't agree with the titrate for comfort. That might be just the terminology. But again, we would titrate that probably to a RAS score or some score that we think would be optimum for our patients. But again, there's, that was a recommendation, but again, it hasn't really been followed in uh, clinical trials to be able to address that. So ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to bring up some uh, final conclusions that I'd like to address with you today. And the first is, we could see that the, the evidence has shown that the SATs and SVTs have demonstrated very favorable outcomes. Some of the data that we present and can present in regards to the quality have been uh, uh, shown throughout the literature time and time again that the favorable outcomes are there. Second of all, we talk about barriers. Uh, again, uh, Ken mentioned that and discussed that in great detail about um, discussing with, with all critical team members. We have to have buy-in from all members. We have to have uh, an open voice. All of us need to discuss what we think are the issues to address by the medical team. And how can we as a team optimize those to be the most efficient that we can be? So I think uh, trying to prevent and lower those barriers as much as possible would be definitely beneficial to the outcome of our patients. Besides that communication, as we know, the number one issue with all of us when something goes wrong, it's always about communication. So making sure that communication is flawless between all team members from the intensivist and pulmonologist, whoever may be in the uh, ICU at that time, or the head of the team, to um, you know nursing and uh, um, medicine and pharmacy and everybody that's a part of that team to make sure that what what we're doing as a team is uh, universal. And then we're talking about the pharmacological selection and weaning. Again, the weaning, as I said, is mostly a, a mechanical ventilatory. Um, uh, issue that we've addressed in the literature, but I think pharmacological selection is very, very key. Make sure to choose the agents to optimize for optimization of the patient's outcomes, and we choose our agents based upon pharmacokinetics and dynamics and some of those adverse effects to patients that we don't want to exacerbate in choosing the wrong agent. And finally, tracking of the SATs and SBTs, including quality control measures. And I want to applaud Ken because that was some great information he provided for us and again, we have to be able to document any type of outcomes. Everything that we do, we're trying to assess outcomes. So at this time, ladies and gentlemen, what I would like to do now is turn our, our program back to our moderator for a Q&A session. Thank you. Next slide, please. Thank you, presenters, for that really, really interesting and informative webcast. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce Diana Mulheran. Um, Dr. Mulheran is a pharmacist, a clinical pharmacist at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee, and she will be moderating your questions today. And just as a reminder, if you have questions, please write them into the question box uh, located on your toolbar. So uh, i hand it over to you, Diana. Thank you, Lori, and thank you, gentlemen, for such a great presentation. Um, I'll start with just a general question, and um, that is, is there a gold standard spontaneous awakening or breathing protocol that clinicians should consider in their ICUs? Okay, Diane, Ken, do you mind if I take that question? No, go for it. Okay, please, please add anything extra, please. Um, Diane, that's a great question. I think one of the issues is that, that I'm aware of there is no gold standard. Uh, there are a number of wonderful trials out there, excellent trials. As I said before, the Shahabi trial, we talked about the Girard trial. There was actually a trial by Robertson that was in critical care medicine in 2008. Uh, all these protocols have slight variations in what they did. So they weren't identical in regards to what they used as um, a safety screen criteria they were a little bit different in regards to how they went to an SBT and so forth. So there are slight differences with them, and I think that's good because I think what that does is it helps us clinicians to understand that um, there are different ways to be successful. And I think one of the most important points is our audience members, if they look at some of this data, to actually craft their own SAT or an SBT protocol, maybe based upon that information take bits and pieces that work specifically and tailor it for their uh, institution uh, and then uh, pilot it there for probably whatever a period of time, maybe six months, 
and as Ken did, doing a quality control to see if there's successful outcomes with that. And, and I would concur because uh, the ventilator settings may differ um, within an institution. Um, and there's been a couple of studies that showed that there's, there's no difference in outcomes between a 30-minute SBT and a 120-minute SBT. So um, uh, there, there are differences if you put a patient on a T2 with no support and let them fatigue. But um, those things have to be individualized to your ICUs, to your patient populations, and to what, what can come to um, um, you know, a set of parameters that uh, your institution is approved and your physicians are comfortable with. Okay, thank you. Um, my next question is, how do you coordinate, and I, this is a question, how do you coordinate these spontaneous awakening trials and breathing trials across large or even multiple ICUs? Uh, that's that's uh, really the, the crux of the, the matter because, um, you know, like I mentioned, we have five ICUs here and trying to set a standard time um, where every nurse turns off the sedation and their patients to try to wake them up and uh, we try to do spontaneous breathing trials at that same time is, is a huge undertaking. So it needs to be coordinated. There needs to be lots of communication. It needs to be um, sort of planned as part of uh, uh, rounds. Uh, so that the timing is, is done appropriately. Um, then, as I mentioned, if you do a spontaneous awakening trial followed by a spontaneous breathing trial and you don't get an extubation order for eight hours, there's, there's got to be some problems. So you really have to coordinate that. And here again, it needs to be you know, whatever works best for that unit um, uh, and um, um, coordinating with the physicians and whatever the decision process is. Some places have automatic extubation orders or automatic extubation process with no required written orders. Some require the physician you know, actually come and, and assess the patient before getting an order. Uh, but um, that's the, the proof in the pudding in regards to moving the bar forward to increase utilization of spontaneous awakening trials and get patients off the ventilator quicker. Yeah, Ken, I have to agree. I think the logistics is, is the absolute biggest challenge. I totally have to agree. I, I've seen certain circumstances where there's intra-team variability. You know, the, the teams have specific uh, different orders of how they think, how things are written, extubation orders and so forth. So you're absolutely right. It's, it seems like trying to line up all the ducks in a row is, is probably a, a, a very challenging situation. It's probably, I would think, based on what you said, probably one of the biggest challenges that you have to overcome. All right, here's another question from the audience. When are, when are SAT and SBTs performed in your institution, and when do physicians round? And kind of along those same lines, how are physicians made aware of the results? Uh, um, it differs in, in each of our ICUs. It sometimes differs between who's attending. Um, and we're, we're uh, sort of dealing with that right now to try to find an optimal time and, and uh, be able to coordinate that. Um, you know, previously we did them end of night shift, 5 a.m., 6 a.m., 7 a.m., um, and we're finding that um, we, we probably need to move that, at least in some units, to more into the day shift, better coverage, more people around, uh, less time till a decision gets made. So. Um, those are, are sort of the logistics, working it out to, to get uh, uh, the details moving forward. Communication, like I said, it should be done as part of rounds uh, so that the plan to do a sedation awakening trial and a spontaneous breathing trial should be discussed on rounds and the results of those should be discussed um, uh, on follow-up rounds. So uh, raising the bar in regards to this being included in the conversation on rounds uh, and the types of sedation and, and the results uh, are, are key to being able to uh, uh, change the culture and move this, you know, using the evidence-based medicine that's out there. Yeah, Ken, and, and the institutions, uh, two institutions that I primarily worked at is, you know, we did that just like that. We worked as the team. The team was, the team was rounding, that's when the SAT and SBT was, was going forward. So there could be observation of the patient. There's one thing of a, you know, maybe you can make a comment, a respiratory therapist or even a nurse calling the physician with the results. 
I mean, the results are one thing, but when you're actually there, you can see the patient, you know, subjectively, and, and not just going by numbers of the of the weaning, uh, you know, if you're doing some type of weaning protocol, but also looking at the patients uh, subjectively. So a lot of times when we've done that as a team, we've been very effective, and we went forward in doing it that way because the team, as you said, talked about the, the ventilatory plan, the pharmacological plan, uh, and also other things. You know, if the person's going to be extubated, getting social work or physical therapy involved, whatever it may be. So doing it at the time when the team is there it, at least worked the most optimum where I was. Uh, and again, that takes that coordination piece, as you mentioned before. And one of the pieces that I showed in my slides was uh, a uh, spontaneous breathing trial results progress note that we created, which was to enhance right. communication and to uh, essentially pull all the parameters together so that there was a, uh, a record, but uh, that, was, that was taken. Some of our units have full-time coverage, and, and so there's somebody there, uh, not just on RAS, but uh, some decision makers there throughout the day. So. Mm -hmm. Another question from the audience. Is there any particular sedative medication that could be used during a spontaneous breathing trial? Any medications that you could use during an SBT? Well, I mean, th there is conscious sedation. I mean, there is conscious sedation out there. Propofol has been used effectively for conscious sedation. But again, um, you have to be very, very careful uh, of titrating those medications and uh, experience with those medications. Uh, the question of it is, is, is the medication truly needed? Can it be given as, as needed? Uh, or does it need to be a continuous infusion? Try to avoid the continuous infusions as possible, um, especially with propofol. There's no antidote, and relatively, it could, a patient's uh, airways and they could, coll could collapse fairly quickly, and they could decompensate. So usually in those type of patients, you want to be able to do a PRN medication, something with a very, very short half-life. If you needed to give something as a short half-life, you can give something such as midazolam. Um, but again, you have to be very, very cautious of what is the ultimate goal? What do you, why do you need to give the medication? Um, and ag again, looking at the patient, if you're giving the patient medications, you know, looking at their neurological status, looking at their RAS scores, if they're completely awake and alert and oriented, um, do they need that medication at that dose or can we titrate it? So traditionally with medications, you could do propofol for, for a conscious sedation, but again, you have to be very cautious with that. And uh, you know, midazolam would be a potential other choice to use for a patient um, and also low-dose fentanyl could be a potential, but again, if you have a patient who has maybe COPD or some type of pulmonary exacerbation of some sort, using a narcotic, you have to be very, very cautious because then you can uh, cause a, a detriment to their respiratory status. And do you have any additional comments about dexmedetomidine? Dexmedetomidine, uh, again, one of the issues with dexmedetomidine, it's a great drug, and, you know, it's only approved for 24 hours, and I know a lot of institutions that use it like post-cabbage patients' uh, open-heart surgery have been very, very effective because the patients will get the analgesia the effect of the drug, and the patients could be uh, weaned off the ventilator very, very quickly. However, the only problem with it is, is this, say, for example, the patient fails uh, an SBT, and you put them on dexmedetomidine. Say, for example, you put them on dexmedetomidine because of the shortest half-life or a short half-life, and then all of a sudden they fail the SBT for whatever reason, and they're, they're on the ventilator. And say they're on the ventilator for another day or they decompensate, and they're stuck on a ventilator for a couple more days. You know, you have to think of dexmedetomidine use. Uh, I know people have exceeded the 24-hour use, and some people have used it longer than that um, in specific patient populations. But based upon the FDA approval, it's something that um, using it more than 24 hours should be avoided at all costs. So you just have to wait for the patient. If they decompensate on the ventilator and they get stuck on it for a couple of days, you may end up keeping them on dexmedetomidine for a little bit too long. Okay. Could either of you comment on the role of nurses in initiating SAT and SBTs? Well, I could start with that. I think nurses are an, uh, an absolute imperative in regards to this process. The one study that I showed, the nurses and the RTs worked um, symbiotically together to make sure that um, and they were done appropriately. I think the nurses are right on the front lines. They're the first people that are going to be able to identify uh, the neurological status of the patient and the breathing status of the patient, the patient's airway, uh, secretion clearance, 
uh, hemodynamics, all those things at the bedside, I think those the nurses are the key point person to actually get that started. The respiratory therapist is in there also, and they're working with the patient intimately. But I think the nurses are probably that first person that may identify globally all the issues with the patient to bring it to the team to uh, then talk about initiating an SAT or an SBT process. Yeah, I think that communication is essential, uh, not only the planning and the timing of, of uh, pairing the SAT and the SBT, but you know, do they have uh, some sort of concordance in regards to uh, uh, titrating to a RAS? And, and so you know, I'm pushing my respiratory therapist to be able to uh, properly score a RAS and make sure that they're communicating with the nurse should be part of the plan, as we mentioned, from rounds. Uh, but the implementation of that plan is essential for the bedside nurse. Uh, and if they have to abort one of these processes, um, uh, that there needs to be strong communication and uh, needs to be transmitted to um, uh, the rest of the team, uh, the results of those uh, endeavors. Are there any altered screening criteria or additional considerations that should be made for patients, specific patient populations such as those with a neuro injury? Hmm. Well, well I, high I ICD it, was, was an exclusion criteria, and uh, you know what we found was that um, the the neuro ICU was doing a better job of waking every patient up to, every day to do a, uh, a neuro check uh, in regards to reducing sedation, so that uh, they weren't masking any of the symptoms. Um, but uh, high ICPs, you know, would uh, sort of be an exclusion. Yeah, besides just the ICPs, I, I guess the other only other thing is, you know, is there, if, if neurological injury is to the point where they have, you know, an unstable or unsafe airway, I mean, they're intubated, we know that, they're ventilated, mm -hmm. but um, besides that, I have to agree, ICP is probably the only thing that at least I've seen in the literature that I'm not seeing. Have you seen any literature or any data with suggestions on how to implement SAT and SBTs in children? Actually, I have not. Ken, any, any No, I mean, and, and people are just starting to look at that and starting to look at those criteria, but there's nothing as robust as what's coming out in the adult literature. Yeah, I have to agree. Okay, we have another question um, regarding patients who are receiving enteral nutrition and whether it's common to turn off enteral nutrition when or just prior to extubation? Well, I guess the first question I have is enteral access. Um, is it, you know, where is the, um, if it's a dot off tube or whatever placement, where is it? Is it post-pyloric or not? If it's post-pyloric, I wouldn't have a problem with that in regards to uh, shutting it off because of risk of aspiration. That wouldn't bother me. But if I had a patient that it was just in the, in the stomach, you know, that would be concerning. Um, it would be concerning from a point of um, uh, what medications could relax their esophageal sphincter that could potentially cause the drug to, or the uh, tube feed to uh, um, reflux and aspirate. Also, of course, uh, you want at least 30 degree incline for the patient. So I guess it depends on where the enteral access is. If it's post pyloric, I don't have a problem. If it is just in the stomach, that would concern me. And I would, if their gastric emptying is adequate, if I shut the enteral tube feeding off, um, I would probably feel comfortable two hours later of instituting a, some type of uh, an SAT or an SBT. Okay. Well, thank you. That concludes our Q&A session. Thank you to our presenters today and to all the audience for participating. Thank you. So thank you for joining this webcast. Please watch the SCCM e-newsletter for future ICU liberation webcasts. We're going to have a number of them planned to address the A, B, C, D, E, and now F bundle, which is the F is for family, um, along with the PAD guidelines. So we would uh, appreciate you visiting with us at those times. And please go to the iculiberation.org website for more information. Thank you to our presenters, and have a pleasant day.